Amen. That was a medley. Oh, the precious blood of Jesus. There is a fountain filled with blood. What would we do without the blood? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the blood of Jesus. We thank you that it cleanses the vilest of sinners. We're grateful today for that fountain of blood that is filled with cleansing power. We claim that cleansing today and the power that comes from it. We thank you for the scriptures and we pray, Lord, that we'd see in the scripture today the power of the blood of Jesus to cleanse, to set free, to forgive sin, to give peace and bring blessing into life. We pray for your Holy Spirit to speak through the scripture now in Jesus' name. Let me give you a little bit of a background before we actually jump into Genesis chapter 18. If you have your Bible and you haven't turned there, now would be a great time to do that. But while you're turning, you know, we have been greatly privileged as human beings that when our ancestors, Adam and Eve, disobeyed God, he only gave them one commandment. When they disobeyed God, he didn't just wipe them out and that was it, end of humanity. He could have done that. But he didn't. Instead, he had a plan in place because he knew what was going to happen. He had a plan in place to employ human beings, the guilty ones themselves, to partner with him to bring about a complete change and transformation of human life and the entire universe. He gives us the privilege of partnering with him. It's an amazing thing. As we look at chapter 18, it's a little odd to us. Here we're looking at Middle Eastern hospitality in ancient times and in the Bedouin people in the Middle East, this still goes on. It's incredible. We, don't, uh, we can't get our minds around it. But I would just give you this background that uh, ancient Middle Eastern society was a patriarchal society. And at the center of that patriarchal society was one key word, and it was the word redeem. And the word redeem was not originally a biblical term, but rather it was a term that, uh, that carried a patriarchal ideal. Here's how it worked. The father of the house the father of the household, and I'm not merely talking about his immediate family, but the extended family, the relatives, the father of the household was responsible to care for the entire extended family. And all the resources of that extended family came to him. And it was the father's job to see to it that the, the household was fed, was clothed, was as comfortable, comfortable as possible. And if any family member at any time got left out, got marginalized, got disenfranchised from the household, such as captured by an enemy like his nephew Lot was, or if there was a family member or members that were out somewhere injured in need of the father's help, it was his job to bring them back to the father's house. And if a family member, for example, lost their property like Naomi uh, did, it was the father's job to take the resources and buy back and restore that land to that family member that lost it. In other words, whatever it took to meet the need of the household, it, the father was going to take all the resources that he possessed and he was going to rescue that family member. It was the father's job to keep the whole household intact and to restore the household. That is what it meant to redeem. That father was called a redeemer. 
He was the restorer of his family, of his household. And when that father died, the responsibility and the resources that the father had were passed on to the firstborn, to the oldest son. The firstborn that God has in his family is Israel. We find that in Exodus chapter 4, for example. In the Bible, God is a father, and his household is the human family. And he gave all his resources to his firstborn son. God picked Israel to take care of all the other nations on this earth and to bring them back to the Father's house because humanity has walked away from God, right? Beginning in the Garden of Eden. And so God redeemed Israel in order to partner with her that she would be the redeemer of the other nations on the earth. Does that then give you an idea as to why God honors Israel and why God has honored Israel and why God hasn't forgotten Israel even when she rebelled as a rebellious son against him even though she has not received God's Messiah he's not given up because the plan hasn't finished yet but this is the background to what we're reading here in this uh, book of uh, Genesis and especially chapter 18 I wanted you to have that because what we find in the hospitality that is offered to these three complete strangers to Abraham, the hospitality there is part of the Redeemer's job. It's part of the father of the household to provide this kind of hospitality. And how important that is in a desert where there is hardly no one at all living, there's no encampments, there's very little places where water can be found, let alone people living. And so, very important part of understanding the scripture, this background that I've given you. But I want to look at this passage very quickly, as quickly as I can, in two parts. In the first 15 verses, I want you to see a visitation that takes place. These three visitors that visit uh, Abraham. And then beginning in verse 16 to the end of the chapter, I want you to see not a visitation, but an intercession. And the intercession is done by Abraham himself. The visitation is done by God. Actually, the visitors are two angels, and the angel of the Lord, which is probably a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus the Messiah. And so what we have, when I say there's a visitation in the first 15 verses, it is a divine visitation. It is God coming down. It is God showing up. Three total strangers, and I want you to see three important things in this first section. And the first thing I want you to note is found in verse 1. And we get it very clearly uh, the identity of one of those visitors has to be God. It says, and the Lord, and notice capital letters for Lord, Yahweh. We would say it in English, Jehovah. That special covenant name for God, his covenant with his people, identified by that name, Lord. And the Lord appeared unto him, meaning Abraham in the plains of Mamre, which is near Hebron. And he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. Get the picture? They're in the desert. He's living in a tent. He's a nomad. He's a Bedouin. He is sitting, resting in his tent because it's the middle of the day. It's the hottest point of the day. He may be taking his daily siesta. I don't know. They do that. But uh, that's, the, that's the picture here. And at that point, we read in verse 2, he happened to lift up his eyes, and he looked, and lo, three men stood by him. All of a sudden, they appeared. And when he saw them, 
He ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed down himself toward the ground. And he said, My Lord, if I now have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, verse 4, be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree while I fetch a morsel of bread and comfort your heart, comfort ye your hearts. After that ye shall pass on, for therefore are ye come to your servant. And they said, so do as thou hast said. I just read the first four verses again. Because I wanted you to see this divine visitation in three ways. I wanted you to see, first of all, the closeness here. As I've already mentioned, this is a divine visitation. This is none other than God himself coming down in some visible human form to meet with a man, to meet with Abraham. It's God stooping down, so to speak, to sit down and to eat together with human beings. You see, when God confirms the time of the fulfillment of his promise, he personally shows up. It's time for God's promise that Abraham would have a son to take place. And so God personally shows up at this moment. God wants to bring people, God wants to visit people, not in a physical way like we see here, but in a spiritual way. God wants to visit every single one of our lives because what God wants to do is he wants to bring individual human beings like you and me, and to those of you that are listening to me, he wants to bring us into a personal relationship with him. God wants you to know him. The God that created you, the God that made you, the God that sustains this planet and our lives, he wants you to come into a personal relationship with him. For that to happen, it requires that blood be shed. It requires that there is a precious fountain filled with blood drawn from the very veins of Jesus, the Messiah himself, Emmanuel, God with us to bring us into that relationship with him because that's what cleanses sin. That's the only sin cleanser. That's the only basis whereby we can be put at peace with God and become the recipients of his life, which is eternal. God wants to, he wants to bring you into a personal saving relationship with himself. And when that happens, you know, he's not done. It's only begun. When God enters into a personal relationship with you, you know what he wants more than anything? He wants you to be close to him. He's looking for closeness. He doesn't just want uh, people that uh, come on Sundays and hear a message and then leave. He wants people to, to walk with him, uh, to be friends with him, to look to him all throughout every day. He wants you to grow in closeness to him, in intimacy, personal fellowship with him. He desires to do that because you know what he did with Abraham? He wants to do with you. He wants to confirm, he wants to confirm you by bringing you into his presence through uh, you experiencing his personal spiritual presence in your life through your time with him in his word and in prayer. God wants, he desires to confirm the word of God and the promises in it to you by you experiencing his spiritual presence in your life. You know what I'm talking about? Have you had that kind of fellowship with the Lord? If you have, you're going to desire more and more of that. If you've ever had a, a, a time where you have sensed God's presence, you want that. That becomes a longing in your heart. You want more of that. And that's what he's seeking. to. That's what I see here, closeness. That's what God wants from every one of us. He wants a closeness of relationship with us, an intimacy, uh, intimacy of fellowship with us. But in the verses that I just read, if I can pick up in verse 5, I want to show you a second thing about this divine visitation. Uh, he says, I'm going to uh, fetch a morsel of bread. Uh, verse 6, I'm going to pick up. And Abraham hasted into the tent unto Sarah. And he said to his wife, 
make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the hearth. By the way, three measures. Literally three sayas. And make it from the finest of, of uh, grain, of meal, which would be wheat. Three sayas, three measures. You know how much that is? Now he has three visitors, right? That is 50 to 75 pounds of flour. She's making bread for them not only to eat, but to take with them as well, but perhaps for the army that the servants that he has also in his household. He's, remember, he is the redeemer of that household. He is the goel of that household. He's going to feed them. So anyway, uh, that's incidental. Verse 7, And Abraham ran then to the herd, and he fetched a tender and good calf, and gave it to a young man, and he hastened to dress it. Doesn't mean put clothes on it, but it means he butchered it, okay? He butchered this calf, and uh, then he took butter and milk, and uh, the calf which he had uh, dressed, and he set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree, and they did eat. He didn't. Second thing I want you to see in this divine visitation, God wants closeness, but I want you to see on Abraham's part, eagerness. It's siesta time. Yet he sees these guys, and Abraham moves immediately. He moves quickly. He moves humbly. He bows at their feet. He moves generously. He puts on a feast for them in the middle of the desert, and he moves in cooperation with them and others. He ran to meet them. He bows before them. He hurries back to the tent to fetch water for them. He instructs his wife to quickly make bread. He ran to the herd. He picks out a choice calf. He uh, gave his servants that calf to quickly prepare it. They, they quickly serve the best, and then he stands back and watches while they eat. I'm sure he came to the realization of who his guests were by now. But see how eager he is in all of this? It's a very interesting thing to me. By the way, another incident, uh, incidental fact, and that is he was 99 years old. It's steaming hot. It's burning hot. And he's running. He's running. And in that ancient Middle Eastern culture, and I think even in, uh, in Bedouin life today, old men don't run. It's shameful. It's undignified. It's lowering. It's humbling. Eagerness. And my point is simply this. Are you eager? Are you eager to meet with God? Are you eager to worship him? Or is it like pulling teeth to get you to even open your Bible? Are you eager to meet with God? Are you eager to have fellowship with the Lord like this is pictured? What preparations have you made to meet with the Lord right now to be together here? Do you know that you'll get out of our time together what you put in prior to actually arriving here? Have you hasted? Have you cooperated with the Holy Spirit? Have you humbled yourself? Have you made preparation to worship and fellowship with the Lord? Or is there an eagerness on your heart? What preparation have you made? Third thing I want you to see here is uh, found in verses uh, 9 to 15, and it's the story of Sarah, so let's look at it. Um, they said, Where's Sarah, thy wife? And he said, In the tent. Verse 10, I will certainly, this is God speaking, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life, and lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. 
and Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. Now Sarah and Abraham were old. He was 99. She's 10 years younger than him. She was 89. Going to have a baby? 89? Sarah heard him. And uh, it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of, of women. Yeah, I would say so. 89 years old. Probably true. Verse 12. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And the Lord said, Why did Sarah laugh? Shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? Why did she say that? Verse 14. Here's a question for you. And here's a question that you should never forget. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Let that ring in your ears for the rest of your days. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Good question. It's a rhetorical question. The answer is obviously no. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. God can do anything he chooses to do. God doesn't always choose to do what you think he should do. But God can do anything he chooses to do. Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Then Sarah denied, saying she lied. I didn't laugh. For she was scared. She was afraid. You know how your kids lie to you when they're scared? <laughs> she lied to God because she was afraid. And God said, you're lying. You did laugh. Don't lie to me. Here's the third thing in this passage, and I get it from Sarah. The third thing about a divine visitation, not only closeness, not only the eagerness on the part of Abraham, but here, what is necessary on Sarah's part, and ours as well, is trustfulness. Sarah laughed in unbelief. When Abram laughed, when Abram laughed last week, I think it was chapter 17, he laughed, but he laughed with joy. She's laughing because she doesn't believe it possible. That's why God says, wait a minute, is anything too hard for me? I mean, if I created the womb, don't you think I can control the womb? Don't you think if there is no womb, I can put one in it? Is anything too hard for me? This whole section that I've just read, verses 9 to 15, is a call to depend totally on God. It's a call to Sarah, but it's a call to you and I to totally depend upon God because God can do the impossible. Do you believe that? And say amen. amen. God can do the impossible. There is nothing too hard for him. Literally, that word hard means marvelous. There's nothing too marvelous for God to do. When we doubt God, like Sarah did, we smear God. We smear him. We smear his name. When we doubt God, we smear him as a liar. And as a weakling, when we doubt God, that's serious stuff. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Trustfulness. And then in verse 16, we pick up the rest of the chapter is intercession. Intercession. And the reason why we don't trust the Lord is because we are focused on the problem instead of the solver of the problem which is him. And that'll drive you over the edge if you don't get that right. So chapter 18, verse 16, this is where the intercession begins. And predominantly in the rest of this chapter, the, the thought is God's justice. Now we know God's sovereign. We know God, God's all powerful. He can do anything. He's control of everything. But the question here is, if God can do anything he chooses, does God always do right? That's what we're going to see here. And there's two things about God's justice. First of all, he reveals uh, something about himself and his ways. 
in verse 16, the men rose up after they had their feast. They looked towards Sodom and Abram went with them to bring them on their way. He accompanied them for a little while. And then the Lord starts talking to himself. Do you ever talk to yourself? It's not a bad thing to do. It's actually a good thing. In fact, you'll find that people in the Bible talk to themselves about things related to the Lord. That's a lot of what the Psalms are about. Talking to you. Why are you cast down, O oh my soul? It's the psalmist talking to himself to slap himself in the face and, and to say, what's wrong with you? Don't you know? Have you forgotten this about God, what God said? So God is talking to himself, but not for the same reasons that the psalmist would. God is talking to himself so that we know what he's thinking. And here it is in verse 17. What is God talking to himself about? The Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham the thing which I do? seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him, for I know him. He will command his children and his household after him. Now, who is he? He is the redeemer. He's the head of the household. Makes sense. I know him. He will command his children and his household after him. They shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. What does God want to do through Abraham? He wants to use Abraham as the redeemer of the nations of the earth, right? And so God's revealing a couple of things here for two reasons. In verse 18, he's, he's going to reveal to Abraham what he's going to do regarding Sodom and Gomorrah and the, actually the five cities of that area, that Jordan Plain. He says, I'm going to reveal it. I, I, I should reveal it to him because of national blessings. By that I mean, look at verse 18, that all the nations of the earth are to be blessed through Abraham, right? Right? We got that way back in Genesis 12, verse 3. And it's been reiterated over and over again. And will. All the nations of the earth are going to be blessed through Abraham. And so God says, I need to reveal to Abraham that Sodom is going to be removed. Is not going to be blessed through him. However, however, Abraham being the channel of blessing to the nations, it's possible that he could still be a blessing by interceding on the behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah. So God does not keep this back from him because of national blessings that are supposed to flow to other nations, and of course Gentile nations, Sodom, and so forth. But in verse uh, 19, he reveals this to him, which sets up the intercession part of this, uh, this chapter, because of family blessing. Not only national blessings, but family blessings. It's through his family, Abraham's family, that there will be national blessings. So Abraham is, sought, uh, is seen here to be the one that will teach his children what's just and right in order for them to enjoy God's blessing. By the way, what is said about Abraham is the task of every Christian parent. I know him, God said. He'll command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. That's the responsibility of every Christian parent, to bring up our children to know God and to know what God says and to see to it that our children, like the, the descendants of Abraham, keep the way of the Lord and do justice and judgment. Do we do that perfectly? No one. But that ought to be the goal of parenthood. 
and especially of fathers. Abram is the father of the household. And there are men here that are the father of the household. And that would include your extended family as well. You have a responsibility to them. Don't cut yourself off from your extended family. You have a redeeming responsibility toward them. Family blessings. And then, following the, the revealing, there is... The, 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 he reveals, then there is the appeals. And I want you to see that in the remaining verses. Verse 20, the Lord said, because the city of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, their, their sin is great, grievous, I'm going to go down and see whether they have done altogether according to... Now, obviously, God knew. He didn't have to go down to check it out. He knew. But this is the justice of God. This is the fairness of God. He personally comes down to show that I'm taking personal time and interest to do this right, to make sure this judgment is not misjudged by anyone. I'm going to see it for myself. I want everyone to know that this is just judgment. So God does that. Verse 21 I will go down and see whether they have done according to the cry of it, which has come unto me. And uh, if not, I'll know. And the men turned their faces from thence. Maybe God wasn't talking to himself. Maybe God was talking to the two angels. I don't know. But at this point, the men, the other two, they peel off. And they went towards Sodom. And there's only two people left. Instead of four, there's only two left. And those two, Abraham and the Lord. Verse 22, Abraham and the Lord. I'm probably going to just end in this verse because you know how the rest of it goes. I want you to see something here. It says, Abraham stood yet before the Lord. God, on the way, speaking either to himself or these two angels about his plans. I think he's speaking to himself. And the two angels leave. They went towards Sodom. But God lingers. God lingers because he wants to share his plan with this man that is at the center of it, that through him all the nations of the earth are supposed to be blessed. And I'm going to take out some of those nations through judgment. But I think he shares it with him because he wants to give Abraham an opportunity to respond correctly to what God says to him. I think that's why God waits before he judges. I think that's why God allows passive judgment before he brings the full measure of his overt judgment on a nation or on a people. Because I believe that God uh, delays and God shares his truth like he shared with us on Wednesday for Romans chapter 1 and following. I believe that God delays and shares his truth to give people, his people, an opportunity to respond to his will for them. What is God's will for you and I? What are we here on this earth for? Are we here to just get a whole bunch of stuff? Are we here just to have a good time? Are we here just to do what we want to do? No, God has put us on this earth for such a time as this. This is a crucial hour that we're living in, in the world and especially in our nation and this city. Has God spoken to us? Has God taught us anything? Does, is God waiting for us to properly, to properly respond? How does God want you? How does God want us to join him in his purpose? I believe that God is deliberately delaying that overt judgment upon this city and this nation because he wants you and I to really intercede. He wants us to be Abrahams. 
He's waiting because he's waiting to see what are you going to do? What's going to be your response? Are you just going to say, oh, this is terrible. Oh, I wish Jesus would come and take me out of this mess. Oh, it's so horrible. Things are getting worse and worse. Oh, my, oh, me, oh. Is that what God wants us to do? Just grumble and complain and get angrier and angrier? Or does God have something better for us in his reason of leaving us here at this time? What is God desiring? It's not real evident in the last phrase of verse 22, but I want you to see it. It says, but Abraham stood yet before the Lord. In my study, I have come up with the realization that there is a scribal revision on that phrase. That means the emphasis is not on Abraham who stood before the Lord, but actually the opposite. It's God who stood before Abraham. It's not Abraham waiting on God. It's God waiting on Abraham. It's God lowering himself. No king stands before a subject. But here God lowers himself as the king, and he stood before Abraham. He lowered himself, and he's waiting for Abraham to say something. He's waiting for Abraham to speak on the behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah that he just said, I'm going to take him out. He's waiting. Why? He is delaying because he is desiring. And what he is desiring is, Abraham, you're the one that I have chosen to bring blessing to the world. Aren't you going to say anything about this portion of the world that I'm going to judge? I don't believe that Abraham would have appealed for Sodom if there had been no divine visitation, because if there had been no divine visitation, there would have been no divine revelation. God visits his people to reveal truth to them that they might do something, that they might respond properly to it. The reason you've ever heard the gospel is because God wants you to respond to the gospel and get saved. The reason God speaks to his people is because he wants his people to properly respond to the truth that he shares with them. He doesn't waste his breath. God meets with you, shows you truth, because he longs for you to be an Abraham that intercedes for your Sodom. And the key to saving wicked Sodom is this. If there is no intercessor, there is absolutely no chance for Sodom. If there's no intercession for our city and our country, there is no chance that this city and this country is going to survive because God is the answer. He's the solution. And the Christian, in that sense, is the solution to the current situation. So we need to examine ourselves this morning, freshly. And by that I mean let God search our heart because God is waiting for you and I to intercede for our Sodom. How much of that have we been doing? I mean, we've talked about it, but how much are we actually doing? I mean, is it just a, a frustration and an anger that uh, stirs us, or is it a deep burden that God has transferred from his heart to ours for our Sodom? We need God to visit us. We need God to pay us a spiritual visit. We need a divine visitation, every one of us, that will stir us up, that will stir us to personal intercession. God wants us to partner with him, to be used by him in what he wants to do on this earth. And I'm telling you, what he wants to do on this earth is not judge this earth. He wants to, he wants to awaken this earth to the truth about himself. I'm going to close with a a lengthy illustration that I'm going to read. Jeremiah Lamphere was a lay minister that lived in New York City. The year 1857 was at the end of a very profitable economic period in the United States. A bubble of prosperity had risen. It had peaked. 
and now it appeared to everyone that it was about to collapse. There was a lot of worry, a lot of concern among businessmen, and New York City had a bunch of them. Jeremiah was aware of all of this, and when he, when, uh, he spoke that, uh, that prayer to God, he said, Lord, what would you have me to do? It began to seem to him that the answer from God was that he should start a prayer meeting. But there was nowhere a man uh, could go in the middle of a tense business week at lunchtime and just kneel down with some other Christian uh, man and pray to God. So Jeremiah arranged for such a place and he advertised it locally. On September 23, 1857, the first meeting was held. It was at 12 noon on the third floor of the Fulton Street Dutch Reformed Church in New York City. When 12 noon came, Jeremiah began praying, and there was only one other person there. A half an hour later, five other men came and had a group prayer meeting for a while and then left feeling refreshed. He let them know that there'd be another prayer time next Wednesday. The next Wednesday, there were 20 who came. Why not? Because the financial crash of 1857 officially began that week. The next week there were 30 who came, and they decided to begin meeting daily instead of weekly. The next day 100 men came. Within three months there was no room in the church anywhere. Every room was full. In the next six months the financial situation worsened, and there were about 150 different prayer meetings in New York City. In New York alone, hundreds of businesses had folded. More than 30,000 people were out of work, and the city was much smaller then. There were financial tensions, political tensions. They needed God, and they knew it. Around 50,000 people gathered for noontime prayer in various spots in New York City. And other towns and cities from coast to coast were doing it also. Literally thousands were attending, praying daily for the Spirit to be poured out in a spiritual awakening on America. This culminated in the third great awakening in our land. More than one million souls were saved during a time when the total population of the United States of America was only 30 million people. Think what that would be today. Do you think God has changed? Do you think God is any different? Do you think God is any less concerned? Do you think God is any, uh, any weaker? Do you think that they were morally, uh, more highly favored of God than we are? God has made a promise that in the last days, which we have been living in since uh, Pentecost, in the last days, God would pour out his spirit upon all flesh. Does that whet your appetite at all to pray for divine intervention, to intercede on the behalf of a world that is in desperate need of a divine visitation in a spiritual way that would awaken people to the fact of who God is and to their desperate need of him? I hate to say it, but let the stock market crash if that's what's needed to wake up this nation and this world. I have a little bit of stock, but I'm willing to lose it all if it means that this nation gets awakened to their need of God. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you will continue to use your word in our hearts. We need, we need you to do that. I pray, Lord, that you would just raise up a Jeremiah land fear that, would use, that you would use as a spiritual spark in this city to kindle a great, roaring, spiritual awakening. Do it for your glory, Lord. We're totally dependent upon you, but you have caused us to be your human partners. We're to pray, thy will be done in earth. And so, Lord, may we intercede as we've been challenged this morning from the life of Abraham. And thank you for visiting us. We appreciate that. We want a greater visitation in days ahead. In Jesus' name, amen.